Welcome back to the channel, everybody. And yes, camera issues. Um, you're going to see them in a couple of these videos coming up. I don't know what's going on, but welcome back to the channel. This is my number four team in my NFL 2024 deep dive series, the Baltimore Ravens. And, uh, you know, this is my pretty face, different camera angle, like I just said. Uh, we'll get to the normal graphics and all that stuff. So you won't have to look at it from this weird angle uh, for very long. But the Baltimore Ravens are a team with a lot of question marks, yet with a lot of sure things. And I think that's the weirdest part about them is they're a great football team. They are number four. They're coming with the MVP quarterback uh, from just last year in Lamar Jackson. But what is their ceiling? What is this team's ceiling? What could they truly do this year to get to that next level? Are they just stuck perpetually as being the team that can't win the big one? Are they just that regular season juggernaut who gets figured out at the end of the day in the playoffs. I wonder what that's going to look like for them uh, this season, uh, especially when you lose your defensive coordinator. Not a lot of experience in the defensive coordinator position at all. So how Zach Orb starts to work in there is going to be a true question. How Todd Munkin works this offensive line. That's another big one there. They lost three starters on the offensive line and they got three Granted, inexperienced players as their replacements. You're hoping that they can reach their upside. Voorhees, I think, has a good upside there. Falele playing guard. We'll get to why I think that's a problem. And Roger Rosengarten, the rookie tackle. All these guys getting these opportunities now with Moses, Zeitler, and Simpson gone. Uh, you're hoping a wide receiver can step up. Say Flowers had a good rookie season. You want him to get to that next level. On the defense side of the ball, Justin Matabuke is back. You did lose Jadavion Clowney, so you lost a lot of your depth and experience there at the edge room. We'll get to why that's probably going to be a little significant. You also lost Patrick Queen to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Trenton Simpson's going to get opportunities now to start next to Roquan Smith. And then you got Kyle Hamilton, who continues to impress. He had a tremendous rookie year. He had a true elite level sophomore season last year. So we're looking to see what they can do with him to continue to enhance his growth as a player. And that's going to be up to Zach Orr as well. And I know I'm doing a lot of like, hey, what's this coaching staff going to do? So let's start with the coaching staff and their grades. So this coaching staff is tied for seventh for me. And we'll start with John Harbaugh, who is my fourth ranked head coach. Uh, it's a real tight race up there in that top five in particular. It's just littered with legends. And Harbaugh has gotten people hired that maybe shouldn't uh, just based upon how he was brought in here to Baltimore following Super Bowl winning head coach Brian Billick and he was a special teams guy and I think that that's sort of dismissed in how he's been able to take over as the CEO style head coach that has seen so much success despite so much turnover in his coaching staff with coordinators and he, he's done a great job of streamlining a quarterback, uh, making sure that that has been a vocal point. He also did a great job of keeping the overall identity of the Baltimore Ravens alive for most of his run there, which was playing great defense. But his, his ability as a motivator, as a team builder, and able to find these diamond in the rough type players and take guys and put them in the right spots and Make sure he's getting guys on the field that fit the scheme, that have good football IQs for the particular moment, more so than anything else. It can't be understated, you know, his history with Andy Reid, number one. Number two, the special teams thing, being able to motivate professional athletes to do the one thing that none of them dreamed of ever doing. When you're playing in high school, when you're playing in college, you're dreaming about, you know, throwing the game-winning touchdown pass or making the game-saving tackle or getting that pick six, you know, late in the game that wins that wins your team the Super Bowl. You don't dream about being the guy who runs down there in the middle of the second quarter and the ball bounces into the end zone, it's a touchback. And that you're super hyped about getting back out there and doing it again you know, once or twice more in that game. That's a special trait to have in a coach. And I think that's why John Harbaugh in particular, he's able to really take on all the knowledge of Andy Reid 
and then apply it to what he had to learn as a motivator in particular. And, you know, speaking of people that got hired because of him, you talk about Joe Judge by the Giants. He came from that. He was that same type of position that John Harbaugh was when he got hired by Baltimore. And it completely backfired. And I think that goes to show how special Harbaugh really is because not it's not something that just anyone can do. It's not something that just any special teams guy can turn around and become. Uh, it speaks to how well he, how good of a study he was. I think it speaks a lot to how great Andy Reid was as an influencer. And I think it also goes to show how great Andy Reid is at giving his assistants, you know, opportunity. And John Harbaugh ate up all those opportunities. And he's going to be with this team for as long as he wants to be. Uh, he is never going to get fired. That's for sure. There's definitely He's definitely not going to happen anytime soon with how great uh, this roster has been built. And another guy who's probably going to be there for as long as he wants to be, which is going to create a really nice streamline of talent and scheme, is Todd Munkin. He's my fourth-ranked offensive coordinator. He came in last year and was so great at putting Lamar Jackson in position to play to his strengths. And that's what really got Lamar his second MVP award. Now, you can argue, did Lamar really deserve the MVP award or not compared to other players? I think that's debatable, and I think it's a fair debate. But he still put him in that first year back into that spot that Lamar had gotten to. I believe he got to it in his second year in the league. Uh, In the second year in the league, he was the MVP got him back to that level. Now, there was some questionable decisions made, uh, particularly in the playoffs with some of the play calling, uh, some of the lack of chemistry between, I think, Todd Munkin and Lamar Jackson in particular really shined through in that playoff game, uh, particularly in how they handled playing from behind, uh, put themselves in some pretty rough positions. I think Munkin got away a lot from what he did that was so great during the year and I also think that he didn't necessarily provide Lamar Jackson with enough confidence to sort of go against what Munkin maybe calls through the headset to then change at the line of scrimmage because there was a lot of situations in that game where it seemed that the play call didn't really match the situation all that well particularly what the defense was showing and the play was never changed Uh, and it led to some very questionable decisions including that interception that ultimately ended the game throwing it into triple coverage. Now you can argue that they should have been playing with a lead at that point because I believe it was a Flowers who fumbled uh, inside like the two-yard line at some point in that game. But that stuff is going to happen. If, as long as you're in the game, you got to sort of throw those away as excuses. And I think that's why it's hard to put Harbaugh and Monk in higher than fourth is because those little moments are what separate you know the number one, the number two coach from... I believe the number three and the number four and the number five. Uh, Someone completely far away from that ranking is the defensive coordinator, Zach Orr, who recently got promoted after um, Mike McDonald went to the Seattle Seahawks. He's inheriting statistically one of the best defenses ever. They were first in every major category under McDonald. But he is very young in his coaching career, which is why I gave him to 28. I didn't put him last due to the lack of uh, experience, simply because he was part of the staff that put together that scheme for that defense last year. So he's going to be basically taking over that same scheme moving forward. Now, you do lose a lot of optimism I'll say optimism because he's not the same guy so will he go out there and just try to do an impression of what they were doing last year what he thinks is the right thing to do according to what they did last year rather than make it his own and I think he if he decides to go and make it his own then this defense will definitely still remain statistically Somewhere inside the top 10 quite easily. Uh, despite you know losing one or two guys here or there. They did maintain a lot of their uh, talent. 
uh, on the defense side of the ball, like the top stars. So there should there shouldn't be too much of a regression in terms of that. It's going to be next to impossible to repeat that statistical output from last year. But as long as Zach Gorsar makes this his own and does something that he understands rather than trying to do an impression, because if he tries to do an impression, then he's not going to be doing something that he truly understands. And it's a mistake a lot of young coaches make, especially when they're promoted. Uh, they usually are doing some type of impression of the previous coach they worked under. Also because they don't want to completely throw that out, especially on the exact same team. If, they were, if Zach Orr were to move teams... I think that he'd have a lot more, there'd be a lot more, a larger likelihood, I'll say, that he would be more of his own when it comes to how he would design and call a defense. The fact that he's staying on the exact same team, that does cause some concern that he's going to end up trying to be Mike McDonald rather than Zach Orr, and that's going to really hurt uh, the defense. Uh, in certain aspects and in key aspects of the game. Uh, be remiss not to mention the passing away of the offensive line coach uh, during the offseason. I know they've plugged in a couple of people in that role uh, since then. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, especially because this how this coaching staff reacts to that and how they pivot so quickly. Uh, because they did lose three uh, starting offensive linemen in the offseason. And so now they have a bunch of guys that don't have a whole lot of experience that are going to have to get brought up to speed rather quickly. So how much of an impact that's going to have on them is uh, something to watch. But I still think John Harbaugh, despite some of the negatives that I've, that I've spoken of throughout the staff, I think the positives, the strength of the positives are so significant and completely outweigh the negatives and that's why they're i'm able to rank this coaching staff very comfortably in the top 10 uh borderline top five i think the performance of zach or this year is going to determine whether or not it truly does become a top five coaching staff and doesn't continue to hover just outside of that now let's talk about really the Somehow the biggest question mark, yet the surest thing on the roster, and that's Lamar Jackson. We'll start with him as just a pocket passer. Just a traditional throwing of the quarterback, throwing of the ball quarterback. He's tied for 12th for me. You can go back and you can watch the video on the Eagles and the criticism I have of Jalen Hurts. It's They're basically the exact same criticisms that you can have of Lamar Jackson. If you keep the game within 25 yards of the line of scrimmage and inside the numbers, Lamar Jackson is perhaps the most dangerous quarterback in the entire league. No one plays better in that space than he does, whether it's with his legs or with his arm. Where Lamar Jackson takes a significant step off, step back, is when you get outside the numbers and you get more importantly, not only outside the numbers, but beyond that 25-yard mark. 25, 30 yards. That's where his accuracy severely drops off. His vision and progressions become more questionable. And that's where you start to see a lot of the mistakes. You'll see him overthrow receivers a lot deep and outside the numbers. Uh, or just general inaccuracies in that area of the field. And I think that's also why they continue to build the roster the way that they have. They've specifically set up the roster to play within the numbers with use the utilization of tight ends with, you know, having a deep backfield with a bunch of different uh, types of players and archetypes of players in the backfield with receivers that are really great in that quick RPO style uh, game and route running and sure and having sure hands out there. Uh, and being able to absorb and take contact even if they might be on the smaller, more shiftier side. That's really where Lamar Jackson's game thrives. And we saw in the game against the Kansas City Chiefs where Steve Spagnuolo was able to take all that away. He was able to take away that area of the field for, in a lot of cases. And Lamar was making a lot of mistakes to the outside. 
you know, into those areas that they were basically forcing him to play in, uh, in very key aspects of the game. And then Lamar had to go back basically to what he was comfortable with. And that's really what led to that interception at the end of the game in the end zone, where he just threw it into triple coverage and it looked absolutely crazy and ridiculous uh, to the viewer. And it, it really was him, Lamar, just looking like he was playing very frustrated at that point. And when you play frustrated, you get sort of outside of yourself, and that's something you can't have as a quarterback. And wasn't thinking of the situation clearly, forcing a ball that he did need to get forced, but into an area where he is comfortable putting the football. It was just, it just had no chance at any point from the time the ball was released and the decision was made. How him and Todd Munkin now work together is going to determine a lot for Lamar Jackson and how he can maybe push himself to become a top 10 passer. Now, he could probably, most likely than not at this stage in his career, he kind of is who he is. You know, he's probably never going to be that Joe Burrow passer. He's probably never going to be, you know, like a Justin Herbert. But that's okay. You just need to make sure that you continue to have a strong scheme and a strong offense and a play calling strategy and play designs that enhance his abilities while also not allowing the defense to just play in a certain area the way Kansas City did and just play discipline off the ends and take away his running ability and force him to make those mistakes that he was making. The one the one thing that they will always have with Lamar Jackson though is ability to run. He's the best by far running threat quarterback that there is. There's nobody better at it than him. He's different than Jalen Hurts in a way where Jalen Hurts has a lot of power to his game while Lamar is like pure finesse he's more like a Michael Vick uh, style of running quarterback while Jalen Hurts has a lot of more power to his game Jalen Hurts is a lot closer to what we got out of someone like Cam Newton than what Lamar's doing which is more like a Michael Vick which brings a lot of dynamicness to the game and I think that's why them bringing in Derrick Henry who we'll get to shortly is a tremendous compliment to Lamar Jackson you're basically getting the best finesse runner and the best like power runner the hardest the two hardest people to tackle for two completely different reasons and putting them on the same team in the same backfield for 75 percent of a game that's a headache for a defense that's a huge numbers advantage that somebody like Derrick Henry's not used to and Lamar's ability here is what opens up those opportunities we've seen a lot of running backs in Baltimore play in that backfield with Lamar Jackson and look fantastic and it's really because of him playing with the numbers advantage, having to have the defense account for him as a runner, which opens up all these opportunities for a running back. And if they overcommit to the running back, Lamar's going to find a hole and he's going to hit it. And he's going to hit it as fast as any running back in the league would. You know, you talk about Christian McCaffrey being able to hit a hole and make a linebacker miss. Lamar Jackson is just as good at that as he is. So being able to position yourself throughout a game to be able to continuously incorporate this ability is what has given Baltimore so much success. It's what gave uh, Baltimore so much success last year in particular. But it's this ability as a passer that inevitably hurt them. And I, and I just, Michael Vick never won a Super Bowl. Cam Newton never won a Super Bowl. Neither one of those guys, Vic or Cam Newton, saw a lot of success outside of the regular season. They weren't these giant playoff juggernauts. You know, they they would encounter certain teams that played with certain disciplines and certain schemes and certain strategies, and they would look completely inept at times. You know, famously Michael Vick, it was when he would play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back then in that Tampa 2 defense. He was absolutely horrific because they penetrated well up the middle and they played discipline off the ends and they had athletic linebackers 
who played smart zone defense. That was the how that was how Tampa would shut down Michael Vick. With Cam Newton, it was a lot of the same type of strategies and forcing him to throw the ball outside the numbers. Because when when Cam Newton was trying to throw the ball particularly deeper or with a level of velocity, his release really slowed down. So it allowed the defensive backs more time to react uh, to the throw. With Lamar, you can sort of look at how Tampa Bay in particular stopped Michael Vick and how Kansas City stopped him in the playoffs last year. And you can see a lot of similarities in that sense. There was a lot of, you know, you had Chris Jones penetrating in the A and the B gaps, just like Warren Sapp would back back then. You had good compliments on the interior like Sapp had with McFarland. You had that with someone like Derek Nandy, for example. Then you had disciplined defensive ends who would play very, very strict lanes there on the outside to contain Lamar within that pocket that then allowed that interior penetration to then push him backwards and improve the angle of pursuit for your defensive ends and then make the job of the linebackers a lot easier because now you force Lamar outside the pocket, he's scrambling somewhere, and you've taken away basically an entire half of the field, allowing your defense to play more athletically like we saw with Nick Bolton, for example, or you see with we saw with Willie Gay or Drew Tranquil. Or you would see with Justin Reed and Brian Cook on the back end, Legereus Sneed at corner. They're able to play so much more uh, instinctually and so much more aggressively that that is what inevitably defeated them. So now with Lamar Jackson, if he ha- if he can't refine this level of his game where he can get that ball to the outside, he can stand more confidently in a pocket, not bail so not bail from clean pockets the way that you'll see him do sometimes, or or not give the offensive or not move with the offensive line to the outside effectively to allow him to more to set his feet a little bit more and to be more sure uh, targeted on the outside and deep to the outsides if he's not able to improve that then Baltimore is going to just fall into that category of being a team that'll probably at best get to an get to an AFC championship game and never get further than that like that'll sort of be their Everest uh, so how Todd Munkin continues to work forward with him uh, you hope that he can something can click that extra little button can click with Lamar and he can get to that next level the running threats here are absolutely fantastic they're tied for 10th and the only reason I have them tied for 10th is because you know Derrick Henry's a great back you just wonder when the wheels are falling off because Tennessee ran this guy into the ground they absolutely ran Derrick Henry completely into the ground and he had some really great years, really punishing years, picked up a couple injuries, some lower body injuries. But you put him, but now he's come into a situation like we just talked about with Lamar Jackson, where he's going to be playing with a numbers advantage that he's not necessarily used to. Even if he's going up against stacked boxes, eight man boxes, which he was very used to in Tennessee. He's, now, he's basically playing against the traditional seven-man box every single time because of how effective the RPO game is and how much respect the defense has to pay to Lamar Jackson. So if Lamar has an extremely effective fake, if he makes you know quick and smart decisions in the RPO game, Derrick Henry is going to be playing with that numbers advantage that he's not necessarily used to despite what the defensive front is going to be giving him. He's got a great compliment in Justice Hill who... If he was the starting back on this team, I would still really like the potential of this rushing attack. Him becoming this change of pace back to Derrick Henry, I think is going to raise this running game up to a completely different level. I think his ability, you know, as a receiving back is, you know, questionable. He's sort of in that like third tier of players. You know, he's tied for 22nd with a 73. The injury to Keaton Mitchell, I think, drastically improved Justice Hill's uh, workload this season. I really felt like Derrick Henry was going to be the true number one star here. And then you'd see Justice Hill probably on early downs. And then Keaton Mitchell 
would get some work as a like third down receiving back. Like that's where he'd get his work in. Sharing those aspects with Justice Hill and then Derrick Henry, of course, getting some reps in there as well. But that's not really Derrick Henry's game. I think they really want to save Derrick Henry, make him that early down back, not overwork him. I think maintaining the quality that they have in Justice Hill, going out and getting a rookie like Rasheen Ali, for example, is going to be their strategy to keep Derrick Henry fresh. I think Lamar Jackson taking a lot of carries also helps Derrick Henry stay fresh throughout the year. I see a world where you get Derrick Henry basically coming out and being like this bruiser and this punisher for most early on in the game to really match the finesse of Lamar Jackson allowing Baltimore to play with a lead shorten the games in particular allow that defense to really pin their ears back and then as the game sort of goes on you get later in the game Baltimore playing with a lead a two-digit lead in those games where they have that that's when Justice Hill comes in and just starts you know scattering through a completely worn out and depleted opposing defense i think that's the world justice justice hill will live in um i don't know how many reps rasheen ali gets to be honest i think he's going to be more just pure spot duty game gets completely out of hand that's when he'll come in but i think justice hill is going to be like your finisher here he's going to be like your closing pitcher if I'm going to use a baseball reference. While Derrick Henry is your flat-out workhorse running back. Now, the concern is that Derrick Henry has is going to hit a wall. He's going to hit it fast, the way we see a lot of running backs do. The great ones will just hit a wall. They'll, have, they'll play great, and then all of a sudden, it's just, it's just too much. Now... The turnover on the offensive line early in the season could have its effects. It could rear its ugly head while they're trying to work out, you know, those three offensive line spots, the two guard spots and the right tackle spot. God forbid Ronnie Stanley gets hurt in that left tackle spot and needs to get figured out too. So there's early in the year, the first quarter of the season, more likely than not, I think there's going to be some shuffling going on on that offensive line. Putting guys in the right spot, making sure that guys, you know, that they're being used to the best of their abilities, whether it's guard or tackle. And that could set up Derrick Henry to have some issues. Another thing that could set up Derrick Henry to have some issues is if Baltimore makes the mistake that Tennessee made early on in Derrick Henry's career. You remember early in the first couple years of Derrick Henry's career, he wasn't, you know, a great, seen as a great back. He was seen as a backup running back you know because what they did was they tried to use him as like this short yardage goal line style back you look at low you look at the measurements of derrick henry and you go yeah of course i would use him that way but derrick henry's skill set has never suited that that's why he struggled so early in his career and why he excelled so much later on when he became a full-time starter and was starting to run a lot of those stretch off tackle plays in particular because it allowed him he he's the type of back that he needs to get to that top speed and once he gets to that top speed he's almost impossible to bring down that's what the strength of derrick henry's game is derrick henry's game his strength isn't hanging the ball off and running into a nine-man box trying to run up the middle that's never been his game you watch that happen He's almost never effective in that role. The way that you stop Derrick Henry is you need gap penetration. You need gap penetration early to stop him from getting to that top speed because it does take him a while to get to that top speed. That's why those stretch plays that he runs are is where he's the most effective. You wouldn't expect that. So if they get in, if they try to use him that way, then this won't go well. I think that that is a very minor concern that only needs to get brought up because he is going to a staff that he's never worked with before that might try to see Justice Hill and Lamar Jackson as your finesse outside runners and try to put Derrick Henry in a position where he's going to be used improperly and that his measurements are going to sort of weigh things out here. 
more so than his actual abilities. Especially because I think that Justice Hill is going to get a lot of this receiving back work. So when they do decide to spread things out, I don't know that Derrick Henry is going to be on the... That's going to be the time for Derrick Henry to be on the field. I think when they use those big jumbo sets... Excuse me. Those big jumbo sets with the multiple tight ends and then running RPO off the with the multiple tight end sets, that's where you're going to see Derrick Henry, those condensed boxes. So how they execute him and get him, you know, to that to that stretch run to that outside I think that that's going to be potentially where the struggles come from but I don't necessarily foresee that being an issue I think Todd Munkin's smart enough and John Harbaugh's smart enough and there's enough tape on there that little old YouTuber me doesn't know something about Derrick Henry that this coaching staff does (laughs) that this coaching staff doesn't right now going to like the real weakness of this offense is the wide receiver room. They're tied for 29th. Let's start with Zay Flowers. I think Zay Flowers really suits this offense really well. He's really effective and as like the RPO route runner wide receiver. You know, he's tough, he's gritty, he plays bigger than what he is. He's not afraid of the contact. You know, some sure hands every now and then. Uh as a ball carrier could go a long way. But for a rookie receiver, that performance last year was really great. He was everything they needed him to be last year. What they need him to be this year is to be somebody who takes that next step up. They need him to establish himself as at least like a middle of the pack number one receiver. Because they were expecting that to be Rashad Bateman. And when they brought Rashad Bateman in... I don't know why they did that, particularly because he wasn't somebody that necessarily fit what they, what Lamar Jackson's skill set was. Lamar Jackson has a very specific skill set that we've talked about, and Rashad Bateman is like more of a traditional outside wide receiver who you want to give opportunities to deep down the field and running like, you know, those breaking out routes and stuff at those intermediate out routes and everything comeback routes all that that's where you want to use a Rashad Bateman and that's not something that's really a staple of this offense which is why I don't think Rashad Bateman's ever really had any significant statistical output even when he has been healthy despite the anticipation for that I don't know why they continually bring him back I think they'd be better suited of filling that role with somebody else who really fits what they're trying to do which is why I think Nelson Aguilar has a place on this team, probably more so than Rashad Bateman does. Despite the issues with being able to actually catch, Nelson Aguilar, his, the strength of his game is that speediness, that quickness. That's something that's way more conducive for success in this offense. Then they brought in Tez Walker, who I think is the, sort of in the same realm here. And then you have Deontay Hardy, who's taking over Devin DuVernay's spot as special team guy, but as like this gadget type wide receiver, you know, effective in the screen game. He's got the potential here to end up having better statistical output than pretty much every of these all these wide receivers except say Flowers. I think he would take a lot of the backup role to Zay Flowers in a lot of situations. You know, you get the RPO screens and all that. I could see Deontay Hardy having some weeks where he looks fantastic. Where he looks so effective, where he's giving defenses headaches. Because he he, he just fits so well. And this is what I'm talking about with having an offensive coordinator that you can keep and for years on end just streamline talent in Deontay Hardy might have found his place his home for what's going to turn out to probably be the majority of his career now because of how well he fits he's somebody who despite the 68 grade could find himself with like a 550 yard season 500 to 600 yard season this year which would be a significant output when you anticipate, say, Flowers will probably be over a 1,000. And you'll have Mark Andrews probably looking over a 1,000. Isaiah Likely will probably be sitting at about 700. 
just because of how they design and their formations and have the type of personnel they use. But I can see Deontay Hardy right up there uh, as a significant contributor in this offense. Speaking of those tight ends, you get Mark Andrews. You know, this is my fifth ranked tight end. He's just fantastic. He's a great all around tight end. He really, again, fits with Lamar Jackson like a glove. Him and Lamar Jackson fit together in a way that you see Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey fit together. Not nearly as well, obviously. There's like levels to this. But they're as good, but Lamar Jackson and Mark Andrews are as good as basically any, but any other combination of quarterback and weapon that you can find. Mark Andrews is so effective at using his size, sneaky athletic, sure hands, and he's not afraid to go up for the catches and coverage, which, especially in between the hashes where he really loves to live in the, you know, you get those play actions where he leaks out and then cuts up the seam. That is where Lamar Jackson really loves to live with his passes. And so Mark Andrews loves to be there as the receiver. So that is a match made in heaven there. You'll see Isaiah likely get a lot of snaps. He was great in replacement of uh, Mark Andrews last year. He's a legitimate number one receiving tight end in the league. He's up there. He's potentially a top 10 guy as well. So having him, he's not a great blocker. He's not going to be that type of guy, which does hurt uh, his projection on this team just slightly because that is going to open up more opportunities for Patrick Kalar and for Charlie Kalar and Patrick Ricard to get on the field. You're going to see some formations where it's Andrews, Kalar, Ricard, Derrick Henry, Lamar Jackson on the field. And they're just going to try to overwhelm the defense with great blocking, great size. And then once they commit to that inside, Lamar Jackson takes it to the outside, and that's that. Isaiah likely will come in. He'll be split out in the slot. He'll be like that bigger slot receiver for them. Working with Zay Flowers, for example, you can see it for there's going to be a formation where you're going to have Mark Andrews at the tight end spot. Opposite him in that slot role, it's going to be Isaiah likely. And outside of him, it'll be Zay Flowers. You're going to see that formation. You know, because it's going to create all these matchup issues, and you're not, you usually are only accounting for one really good receiving tight end at most if you're an opposing defense. When you have to oppose for two guys with that size, someone is going to be outmatched. And then you have sneaky Zay Flowers, who's going to run a little quick, a little quick drag route. And now you got a big play with not a lot of air yards. It's a great little group they put together here. The only fear is this wide receiver room is in order for this offense to truly get to that next level, two of these guys need to level up. Zay Flowers needs to level up. Then between Bateman, Aguilar, Walker, and Hardy, one of those guys there needs to level up. I exclude Tylen Walls because Tylen Walls is really on the team as the backup to Rashad Bateman. There really isn't another true archetype that could be a backup that's listed here other than Tylen Wallace. I think that's why they kept him. But one of those, two of these top five wide receivers need to level up to get to help Lamar get to that next level. Lamar is not the type of passing quarterback who is going to make all these receivers around him better. That's just not what he does. What what he does is he makes a lot of the running backs in the offensive line look better. They need some of these wide receivers to really step up, you know, regularly create separation to give Lamar Jackson the confidence to expand his game as a passer. I think them not having the top end talent has affected Lamar Jackson's confidence in going, trying to become that next level. Because every time he has, there's sort of been the you know, lack of separation on the outside. So he's forcing a lot of things like that leads to a lot of his overthrows. Uh, And just lack of accuracy, just trying not to throw those interceptions because he doesn't trust the separation. He doesn't necessarily trust the wide receiver has the opposing cornerback beat. So what these guys need to step up, put themselves as a top 20 wide receiver room. And I think that'll make a significant difference for Lamar Jackson as well. Moving on to this offensive line. And despite losing three starters, their pass blocking is still tied for eighth. 
really it's led by Tyler Linderbaum and Ronnie Stanley. Linderbaum, probably the best overall center in the entire league. He's definitely in the top two, top three at worst. Depending on how you view Creed Humphrey and Frank Ragnow, really. There really isn't a hole in his game. Perfect fit for the roster, perfect fit for the scheme. And a really good second quarterback on the field to command that offensive line. He made a lot of guys a lot of money in the offseason with his ability to make the guys around him much play much better than they probably actually were, particularly guys like John Simpson, uh, who made probably more money than he should have going to the Jets. Uh, and he's going to have to do that with Andrew Voorhees and Daniel Falele. Uh, Andrew Voorhees getting into that starting role now. Uh, I really liked him in USC. The injury concern sort of dropped him significantly in his draft. He was probably should have been a day two pick, an early day two pick. Um, we'll see how he sort of fits in now that he's got this uh, starter's role sort of locked in from the looks of it. Then there's Daniel Falele, who is this monster. 400 pounds, he's like 6'8". Don't know how he's going to work out at guard, to be honest. He is a monster to be playing guard. And when you got Lamar Jackson, who likes playing within the hashes, I don't know that having a guy that gigantic as a guard is a good idea. We'll see how it works out. He didn't hasn't really worked out at tackle when he's gotten his reps, but I don't know how this is going to work out for them. Uh, I do think he's got really good ability. I just don't know that his ability isn't going to still just because of his size affect Lamar Jackson's play. Then you got the two tackles. And we'll start with Ronnie Stanley, who at one point was a top five tackle. Injuries and play regression have sort of dropped him down. He's still a good pass blocker at left tackle. He's not somebody you necessarily have to worry about other than his health concerns when it comes to pass blocking. He's still very much a good player. We'll get to his run blocking a little bit later. Then there's Roger Rosengarten from the University of Washington who's got this right tackle spot locked in, replacing Morgan Moses, who left for the Jets as well. This The right side of the line, in general, is very boomer bust right now. And this is what's really going to determine how good the offensive line truly is. If Ronnie Stanley stays healthy, I have no real concerns about the left side of the line. The right side of the line, Roger Rosengard, Dan Play, this could go horrifically wrong. And this is where, when I talked about earlier, a lot of the shuffling would happen, is I think at these two spots here. Because they do have some decent depth with Patrick McCarry and Ben Cleveland in particular, who as veterans, I think, you know, the, the ceilings are much lower than what you get with Falele and Rosengarten, obviously. But I think the floors are a lot higher as well. Uh, so I could, there could be a time, you know, a third of the way through the season where Cleveland is the right guard and Makari is the right tackle, and that's the offensive line they go with. They go with the higher floor than they do necessarily the higher ceiling just because Falele might be too gigantic to be playing guard, and Rosengarten just has general rookie issues playing uh, the right tackle role. They also have Josh Jones, who I guess him and Patrick Makari have sort of the same flexibilities, though Josh Jones had his best performances at left tackle. I would expect if Ronnie Stanley misses any amount of time that Josh Jones is the one that steps into that spot. That's really where he's played his best game uh, throughout his career. That's been sort of riddled with disappointment other than one season with the Arizona Cardinals. Um, Mala Laulu, uh, all-name Hall of Fame, I think he's more of just a fifth interior offensive lineman. Nick Samick is your backup center, uh, who doesn't give you much in pass blocking at all. You get to run blocking, they're tied for 21st. Ronnie Stanley just sort of drops off there. Uh, Andrew Voorhees sort of just is what he is, very balanced across the board. We'll see which aspect of the game he really excels at. I think he's one of those even keel uh, linemen, sort of like Tyler Linderbaum is. Tyler Linderbaum is just, you know what you're getting. Great run blocking, great pass blocking, elite level play. Voorhees has a lot of the same features there, so you you wonder if in this scheme, as he gets comfortable, I think he could really get to a level where he could be a really effective guard long term. And then you see Falele and Rosengarten. In the run game, they really fall off. 
And this is a team that's going to be relying a lot on the run game to really run this offense. It's going to be one of those, one of the few teams in the league that play at such a high level. And the balance that Patrick McCarty brings you as an offensive lineman, I could see why they keep him as this like swing lineman to a degree, but I also think that he needs to I would love for him to be in the starting lineup and just, you know, go for it here. You know, I don't I don't particularly like the strategy they've gone with here where they're looking at this high ceiling and hoping that one of these guys break out. I would pre much prefer them to just raise the floor, make Makari your starting right tackle or your starting right guard, and try to win the Super Bowl. I think that that decision is going to backfire for them early in the year. Now, I do think Patrick McCarry is going to end up being a starting guard in the league. I think that's absolutely going to happen. I just don't like that they're not initially going with that. I understand Ben Cleveland because Ben Cleveland's not a great run blocker. And they want to run the ball. Fine. Patrick McCarry is probably your second best run blocker on the team. I just, I, I wonder, I do question the strategy here. Overall, it's my sixth ranked offense, tied for ninth in passing and third in rushing. And really the, the thing that's holding back the rushing is like what I just decided, what I just said, is the offensive line. And if you just raise that offensive line up to like a top 15 offensive line, then you do have the best rushing attack in the league. And I would truly believe that. It is that one thing that does hold them back a bit. Now, obviously, that's not a significant thing they're holding them back for. They're still third in the league. But you are putting perhaps more pressure on your actual rushing weapons than you than you have to. I understand they have the ability, but you don't have to put the pressure on them that they're kind of putting on them, especially early in the season. Now, moving on to the defense. And what you'll notice about this defense is that the talent level doesn't necessarily reflect what they were able to do last year. Like they did lose a couple guys to start at the edge room. They did lose Jadavion Clowney, uh, who was fantastic for them last year as a part of this like three-headed monster they created with Adafi Owe and Kyle Van Noy. They do lose a lot from losing Jadavion Clowney. Adafi Owe now has to step in and become this top level edge rusher he's got to step up the way that they're hoping that someone like Zay Flowers for example would step up the way they didn't get out of Rashad Bateman who I believe they drafted in the exact same year by the way Kyle Van Noy sort of had this career renaissance coming in playing this hybrid 3-4 defensive end 3-4 outside linebacker excuse me 3-4 outside linebacker that opened up a Dafael way to play like this more traditional defensive end role in the defensive scheme that they ran uh, Adafi Owe plays with such a high level of speed and athleticism and this reckless abandon that it has gotten him caught in a lot of ways when he's been in a position where power would have been more effective he doesn't, all, he doesn't go to that as often as he should and when he does go to it he's not overly effective at it and I think that it just comes from him having to develop that aspect of his game because teams are especially when you get these better these more high level elite level tackles they can handle a guy who's just one thing and I think that is what stops Adafi Owe from getting to that next level Kyle Van Noy I think has a good mix of everything and he just doesn't do anything overly great he's the perfect example of another like high floor low ceiling guy especially at this stage of his career they're really hoping that Adisa a Isaac or David Ajabo can step up and be this early down guy this sorry this pass rush situation guy to allow Kyle Van Noy to maybe play just more on early downs uh, you know get more athleticism get more speed out there uh, but they need that to step up jabo has got all those injury concerns Adisa Isaac is much more of an early down player especially it's going to be that way early in his career and you get to that early down work they are tied for 14th Adafi Owe is you know disciplined at setting an edge but again, when you get into those situations of power, he's going to struggle. And I think Adisa Isaac could really pick up some reps here. And they could have an early uh, edge rotation, including uh, Tavius Robinson, who's a guy who's sort of been there for a while and understands the defensive system and can play some disciplined ball. 
to allow opportunities for Adafi Owe in particular, who uses the hyper athlete, you know, puts his uh, foot to the floor on the gas pedal, uh, so to speak, to get more quality reps in these passing situations. Um, I just don't see Adafi Owe, even though he is him and Adisa Isaac, I, I put him on the same levels, and I think Owe will get more reps. I just don't see this as being a true strength of his game, and you're hoping that somebody else can step up and be truly effective here. So like what you saw with Michael Clemens with the Jets last year, or two years ago, where he was so great on those early down situations, it opened up so many opportunities for edge rushers to work um, in those more quote-unquote fun scenarios. Uh, they have great compliments on the interior here, one of the best interior groups, tied for 10th in interior rush. You know, Michael Pierce, the big veteran, nose tackle, still playing great ball. Uh, I think him and Travis Jones are going to have a nice rotation going between the two of them uh, throughout this season. Travis Jones is sort of the direct backup to Michael Pierce, who I don't know at this stage they were expecting him to still be a, st a starter quality player, but he's still s really good at everything. Uh, Justin Matabuke coming off a career year. I do take pause in ranking him too high because we've seen so many times you get these interior defensive linemen who have these giant breakout seasons and never get back to it especially when you lose your defensive coordinator that breakout star who broke out underneath that one guy and never really did anything else under the previous regimes that is something to watch now I'm not directly calling it I think that there's a high possibility at the end of this at the end of the season we're looking at Justin Matabuke in very similar light to the way that we looked at Jeffrey Simmons for a while there. Uh, I, I feel like they're very similar players. Uh, but he's still a surefire number one interior rusher. I would hold him back from being put into that elite class with like Dexter Lawrence and Chris Jones and Quinnen Williams. But he's also got a lot of balance to his game. And that's why when they're going against the run, they're actually fourth in the league. With him and Michael Pierce. Michael Pierce, again, great nose tackle. Travis Jones, I think, will get on the field in these scenarios when they want to go to a more traditional 3-4 front. You'll have Jones, you'll have Pierce, you'll have Matabuke out there, and that's a hard front three in particular for those offensive linemen to deal with, and that's going to open up so many opportunities for the linebackers in particular, and it's going to allow the edge rushers to maybe play a little bit more freely uh, and open up opportunities for them. Uh, to not get caught or anything like that. Uh, especially when you got Brent Urban, who's a good little 3-4 defensive end type who can come in and be serviceable in these scenarios. I look at Broderick Washington sort of in the same light as Tavius Robinson, where just his familiarity uh, is an asset here. So he will get some reps. I do anticipate all five of these uh, edge, edge players and all five of these interior linemen to see the field throughout games and to get some significant playing time and have a really healthy rotation in there. Of course, with these top four guys being the true breadwinners, I think, but I don't foresee any of these depth pieces not being used and used effectively. Moving on to the linebackers, and they are third in linebacker coverage with Roquan Smith and Trenton Simpson. Now, Trenton Simpson is sliding into the Patrick Queen role here who broke out as the number two linebacker to Roquan Smith, who is a legitimate number one linebacker in the league. Uh, I don't put him as highly as, say, Fred Warner. I think as an overall linebacker, he's like him and C.J. Mosley, uh, Quincy Williams. You know, they're all in that sort of group together. Drake Greenlaw is another one. I do think Fred Warner sort of stands alone. Uh Roquan's got this ability to be really smart on the field. He's really good at disguising what he's doing. He's really good at uh, counteracting what the quarterbacks are doing at the line. He's good at identifying things pre-snap. You see him doing that all the time. He's a really, really great green dot linebacker, so to speak. He's he understands the defense. He also understands the opposing offense. I think that's sort of something that's missed a lot is you can tell Roquan Smith does a lot of studying of offenses. That he he probably in his life has designed a lot of offensive plays. 
like he just gives off that vibe because you can see even against the more creative offenses he sort of is anticipating and can sort of see what's going on here he can look at a player and see how they're lined up and be like okay this is what they're probably going to be doing so if i'm in so if my zone come zone responsibilities are here maybe i can cheat over a little bit and take this away before coming back and then creating a big moment and you've seen him do that in games against some really great quarterbacks as well he's also able to find identify where the soft spots are in in the his own defense's zone and make up for those soft spots with great anticipation and great speed understanding the route combinations and being able to cut those areas off to give his front four a, a more of a chance to you know get home in that sense you look at trenton simpson he came into the league where this was always going to be part of his game and that the the effectiveness against the run was going to be where he needed to develop and now he's going to be out here getting those reps he was drafted specifically because i don't think they ever were planning on bringing back patrick queen uh even when patrick queen broke out i think there was sort of just like okay yeah we'll keep you for this but we're not gonna throw the the checkbook at you by any means because we did draft trenton simpson anticipating we were going to lose you he's coming in in the same sort of vein that patrick queen was brought in with with the same uh upside i would say to a degree patrick queen was a first round pick trent simpson wasn't but i think that also has to do with just i think teams falling out of love with the linebacker position in general and linebacker not necessarily being a first round pick anymore unless they're truly truly seen as elite i don't know that patrick queen with his skill set coming into the league the way that it was would be a first round pick in like last year's draft for example even the year previous but they're basically taking a mulligan here on Patrick Queen and hoping that they can develop Patrick Trenton Simpson in a way they couldn't with Queen. Uh, Malik Harrison, you know, they didn't keep a lot of linebackers, which makes me think Malik Harrison is going to be back in being solely just more of a traditional off-ball linebacker. I could see him being a backup to Kyle Van Noy in a lot of ways as well. Uh, but I think mostly this is going to be what his role is just because they didn't keep the bodies. You get to the linebackers here against the run. And this is where Trenton Simpson does struggle. And I think Malik Harrison can get a lot of reps in this sense here. They are tied for 19th. Roquan, again, solid player against the run as well. I think he's really great. Um, sort of, again, he's sort of just below, for me, that top tier. And I know that probably makes a lot of Raven fans upset. And I'm probably going to hear it in the comments section. But he also... There's also some deficiencies to how he does play against the run at times uh, that you don't see out of the truly elite run-stuffing linebackers. Now, that also is in correlation with what is going on in front of him. And you can get in situations where his front four does put him maybe in a spot that's pretty rough. You know, he, there are aspects of the RPO game against certain teams where he is going to maybe hang in there for the pass more so than he's going to attack the run. And that does open up opportunities as well for the, for the opposing offense to hand the ball off. I think he trusts his athleticism more to be able to run down, to force them to hand the ball off, put them in a position where they have to hand the ball off, and then use his athleticism to try and make the tackle. And that works a lot of the times for him, but there are have been times where that's put him in a rough spot where maybe he had a slight hesitation that put him in a position where he did get sort of cut off there and a big run does happen at his expense. Um, doesn't happen all that often. Make that clear. It doesn't happen all that often. But with him and, him and Trenton Simpson, he's going to have to be like this director for Trenton Simpson the way that he was for Patrick Queen. Uh, and this is really where the real question marks are. If Trenton Simpson can elevate his game in the running attack, then this could very well become like a true top five linebacker duo in the league by the end of the year. That There is that upside to it. Uh, but there also is the downside where Roquan Smith is out there doing this all by himself. And that could lead to deficiencies in his own game uh, because he ends up having to try and do too much to make up for everyone around him because they didn't keep a lot of these like currently high-end players they really just kept trenton simpson for his upside right now and malik harrison and chris board especially they're kind of they kind of are who they are going over to the defensive backs and we'll start with the corners they're tied for 18th here uh with their overall cornerback play marlon humphrey 
uh, sort of has regressed over the last you know couple of years. I think he's still a legit number one. I just think he's more of like a middle number one corner now as we've seen some of these younger generation guys come in and sort of surplant him. Um, so in comparison to the other guys, to a lot of the top corners in the league, this is what he grades out as. You know, I don't think his regression has been that significant. I just, I think it's had, it has obviously been there, but I think it's some more of just a lot of great corners have entered the league as well. They're just better than him. So that does affect his overall grade. I still like him putting him out there, put him out to one side. And then if you have Nate Wiggins, who's their first round pick, you put him out to the other side and sort of let them grow together in that one role. That's also a good thing that Baltimore has done, especially with the McDonald scheme is they've put guys in a position where they play one position and they master that position. Saw it with Kyle Hamilton, who we'll get to shortly. I would anticipate doing the same thing here with Nate Wiggins. He'll play outside corner on one side of the field and that's it he'll learn that and he'll do that all year and then next year they'll introduce to moving him around probably a lot more but i anticipate 90 percent of his snaps will happen in the exact same spot all year then you got tj tampa who i think is going to get some opportunities to compete here mostly because brandon stevens you know is so versatile he can play outside corner he can play in the slot he can play back at safety and i think from week to week you're going to see brandon stevens move around a lot and that'll open up opportunities for tj tampa i think if they are in need of a just a pure slot player that's where you'll get our darius washington to step in as well i think our darius washington and brandon stevens are direct um you know correlate they're like bateman and wallace to a degree where washington i think is the direct backup to brandon stevens here uh, Jalen Armour Davis, I think, is just a death piece at this point. Um, mostly because he doesn't really have a specialty as an inside or outside corner here, the way it, Washington does, for example. Uh, but you get to the safeties, and they have the best safety coverage in the entire league. And they lost a starter from last year in Geno Stone, who graded out for me as an 87 or an 88 or something. Something really high, like a true number one. So they lost that. And they're still the best. That goes to show how strong this group is. They replaced Geno Stone with Eddie Jackson, which is a downgrade significantly. But they downgraded from being significantly the best to really the best. Which, I mean, that's semantics really at that point, right? Going back to what we talked about just a moment ago with Kyle Hamilton. What Kyle Hamilton did in his rookie year was they played him in one spot. And he got comfortable with the NFL game, got comfortable with the NFL speed, and mastered that spot and had a great rookie season. Last year played truly elite because they were able to move him around. He played linebacker for like 20% of his snaps, which I think we can see, especially if Trenton Simpson starts to struggle. But he was able to move around at that point more comfortably because he understood the speed of the game. He understood what everyone's role was in the defense. He knew where to be. He had all that film time. And that was where you're able to take him to the next level. And I anticipate them doing that with Nate Wiggins um, the same sort of way. You take your first round pick, get him used to the game, and then second year is when you can start to unleash him in different ways to confuse offenses. Marcus Williams is going to be your deep safety, deep third safety. That's going to be his role here. There's going to be some formations where you're going to see Kyle Hamilton, Marcus Williams, Eddie Jackson on the field at the same time. You're going to see Kyle Hamilton, Marcus Williams, and Brandon Stevens playing deep. Um, in like a cover three sort of split a lot. The creativity that Zach Orr can have with this different variety of skill sets is basically endless. You get to them in run support. All they really have is Kyle Hamilton, but then they has got these other finesse guys here. So it does drop them to 23rd. That's really the only concern here. But if you play Marcus Williams in a deep third safety role, his appearances in the run game aren't going to be all that often. So I think, you know, again, you can have the scenario where it's Marcus Williams, Kyle Hamilton, Brandon Stevens. And then I think you have optimized your defensive backs uh, in terms of their ability to play and run support. Uh, Also, you can have Kyle Hamilton because he's so versatile. You can create a lot of scenarios where you're going to confuse offenses and get them to do things. Uh, 
to work right and play right into your hand. You can have Kyle Hamilton line up at linebacker and he can bail into that deep safety role and vice versa. He can be at a deep safety on the right side of the field and then retreat all the way down to, to into flat coverage or into hook curl coverage or go to the other side, go from one hash to another coming down the field or going vertically up the field to just confuse these guys. And he's got great, such great range, such great size, such great athleticism, such great ball tracking while the ball's in the air that he really does have the potential here to be to have that defensive player of the year caliber season where he gets that Duran Bland seven, eight interceptions in the season. Just because I think again this year, they're going to up the ante with him again. Now, how Zach Orr goes about that, I would be much more confident in McDonald, obviously, doing that than Zach Orr. But I think that's going to be something where Zach Orr is going to be able to put his stamp on this team is how he uses Kyle Hamilton and how he manipulates the skill set that Kyle Hamilton has to enhance the overall defense. So this is my sixth ranked defense, second in pass coverage, and they are 19th in run defense which they're so high level in pass defense and the way that they run this team in general, I'm not concerned at all. Sixth ranked overall defense, absolutely incredible talent wise. So it is my fourth ranked teams tied for seventh in coaching, sixth offense and sixth defense. Coaching staff has so much to work with here. The style of play they run is perfect complements of one another. Aggressive, creative defense and just game shortening, effective running of the football, finesse running of the football. Now with that mix of power, this is going to be a really effective football team this year. But again, the concerns remain the same. What is the ceiling when you have the quarterback that you have? And there you have it. My number four team, my 2024 info deep dive series, the Baltimore Ravens. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Do all that YouTube thing that I know you guys love to do oh so much. And I really appreciate you guys being here and watching this entire video. Again, leave your comments in the comment section below about what you think about what I think about the Baltimore Ravens. And like, I'm not used to this camera. Here and here probably is where the rest of the series is. Yeah, the playlist or the playlist and the next video, the number three team probably if it's already been posted. And then the, 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 the subscription button right there. Right there. Did I do it right? Well, I guess we'll find out in post, right? See you guys next time. Bye.